in a Supreme Court decision that has people wondering, wait, did I just wake up in the past? We just found out that Trump has to turn over his tax returns to New York State prosecutors. Trump might be getting the old Al Capone treatment. Forget high crimes and misdemeanors, we'll get him on taxes. Now before we get into today, I want to give you guys a little context, because the real landmark case here happened almost two years ago. Last July, the Supreme Court ruled that the president couldn't use his office to protect his tax returns. Now That didn't mean he had to turn them over at the time, it just meant that he had to get a better argument. To quote that 2019 decision, a president may avail himself of the same protections available to every other citizen, including the right to challenge the subpoena on any grounds permitted by state law, which usually include bad faith and undue burden or breadth. Now, if we all know something about Trump, it is that he's not the type of guy to shy away from a good old fashioned court battle. He gathered his legal team to write a whole new list of subpoena blocking arguments. Alright, so I can't use my position as president to immunize myself, but I can still fight this using the same tools available to every other citizen. If this is an inherently bad faith or overzealous investigation, I can fight it. Specifically, in today's arguments, Trump was alleging that this tax subpoena was overbroad and was issued in bad faith. So first, let's focus on that overbroad argument. Basically, we believe you may have been jaywalking back in 2017, so we're going to need 20 years of your tax returns. That would be overbroad. In order to prove a grand jury subpoena is overbroad, you need to show that the information sought has nothing to do with the crimes being investigated. In his filing, Trump alleged that the focus of the district attorney's investigation is payments made by Michael Cohen in 2016 to certain individuals. And it's official, that Stormy Daniels payment was the single least effective use of hush money in history. We're still talking about it five years later. So subpoenaing eight years of tax returns because of those sketchy campaign transactions seems like quite the overreach, right? Well, here's the rub. Grand juries are a bit strange. It's not a trial. We're not figuring out whether a party is guilty or not right now. Instead, it's like prosecutorial shark tank. The attorneys general bring their potential charges and evidence to the jury, and then the jury votes on whether to accuse someone of committing that crime. Hello jury, my pitch today is election finance violations. What I'm going to need from you is a buy-in of 8 years of tax information. If you think that's reasonable, vote so I can subpoena it. The jury is able to vote for evidentiary subpoenas and subsequently which, if any, charges to file when the investigatory sands have settled. The problems for Trump's overbreath argument is that grand jury processes are very hush hush for quite a few good reasons. For example, if the grand jury decides not to charge someone, you don't want that innocent person to experience unwarranted persecution. You want full disclosure from witnesses, and you don't want the jury to be harassed. Now, this unfortunately butts heads with Trump's overbreath argument, because we don't actually know what charges are being considered. According to the decision, the president asks us to infer that, because the Cohen payments were a focus of the investigation, they must have been the only focus. You see, prosecutors could be investigating any number of things not publicly known. What we do know is that one of those things is the hush money payments. Unfortunately for any sense of closure in this episode, the prosecution team is also being incredibly coy. In August, prosecutors suggested in court papers that they may be looking into tax fraud, insurance fraud, and falsification of business records. That was in response to Trump's contention that the probe was focused exclusively on hush money payments. Is the investigation bigger? Maybe. Or maybe not. What I can say is the jury we convene thinks that the evidence we're subpoenaing is relevant to the charges we're considering. Read into that what you will. Now what Trump had to do to successfully argue that the subpoena was overbreath 
was proof that he was only being investigated for hush money. He was unable to affirmatively prove that he was only being investigated for hush money. So in response to that, the courts deferred to the judgment of the grand jury. Remember, it was the grand jury who voted that this was a relevant document to subpoena for the investigations. So now to the other issue. This subpoena was issued in bad faith. Now there were two main thrusts to this accusation. The primary thrust was Trump's concern with New York City Attorney General Cy Vance, specifically him using the grand jury subpoena power to get information that was embarrassing to the president. Now, unfortunately, there was a glaring hole in this argument. Any document produced under the subpoena would be protected from public disclosure by grand jury secrecy rules. Now there are those secrecy rules again, except this time coming to the rescue of the Trump administration. Yeah, his tax returns aren't about to be the New York Times bestseller this year. Now this leads us to the other main thrust of Trump's defense. Cy Vance issued that subpoena in bad faith. Years ago, A.G. Vance successfully subpoenaed financial information from the Trump Organization as part of this investigation. Trump refused to turn over his personal tax returns as a part of that subpoenaed information. Now, Trump argues that Cy just got so angry about that that he did a spite subpoena. Now, this story plays out two different ways, depending on who you're asking. This decision succinctly laid out both stories, starting with Trump. AG Vance misinterpreted the Trump Organization subpoena to cover the president's tax returns. He then decided not to defend his interpretation in court and just kind of stewed in anger for a bit. Finally, he issued this new subpoena. Now, the plausible alternative explanation is Sai's story, and he argues that he agreed that the original subpoena did not clearly call for the documents needed in the grand jury investigation, so a new subpoena was issued that clearly called for them. Now, unfortunately for Trump, he was unable to provide any evidence that this was a grudge subpoena as opposed to a clarification subpoena, designed to explicitly ask for information that had only previously been implicitly asked for. So now we're here. Private citizen Trump's overbreath and bad faith arguments both failed at the Court of Appeals. And as we saw today, the Supreme Court anonymously affirmed that Court of Appeals decision. What that means is that now Trump's personal tax information will be turned over to investigators, who will now begin the process of shark tanking their different charges to a grand jury to see if any stick. Until we figure out what those charges will be, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! First I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to ring that bell and click subscribe so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.